All right, now we're back with part three. And while a few minutes have passed, um, I have merged those files and removed all the intermediate steps. I now have one single file called parking with 42 million observations of 40 variables. And I'm going to perform another step here, which is to take a 1% sample. I'm going to just hit enter there so I start running the command. And we're taking a 1% sample so that we have a smaller unit that we can actually start working with and have very responsive commands. Uh, when, we, when we have this large scale data and we're just exploring it, we don't want to wait for two minutes for each command to complete. Um, until we, we decide that we're really ready to do our final analysis, it's always very useful to work with a smaller sample. And in particular for this video, I'm going to be relying on that a bit more than I normally would because I want to make the video concise and not um, bore you to tears with, with uh, waiting too much, even though there's some element of that in this video already. So you can see that that command is, is going to run for a little while. It does have to loop through you know, those 42 million observations. Um, and uh, I should also note while, while we were gone, um, as I worked with those files, I gradually got up to my 32 gigabyte memory limit. And, and one thing that happens is when we get near the memory limit, a lot of time is spent out swapping, you know, doing a lot of swapping in and out. You'll note that it, it hovers above 32,000, but the hard limit is 32,100. So it's always um, taking in and out little chunks to the swap space so that it can, it can manage that. And once it completes a step, it may be able to free up a big chunk of memory, and that speeds things up a great deal. Uh, this is the thing that I'm nervous about, uh, that is the kind of thing that might start interfering with the audio uh, recording if the computer gets a little too busy or overburdened. So this is one step I'm doing live. Uh, I might avoid some other ones in the future. Okay, so. As an aside, if you're working with this data on AMREL, you can skip the merged, the mergings part and just download my pre-created samples, uh, which are in the Scratch directory if you use these um, paths. So if you were having trouble with the merge or you know that didn't appeal to you, you can do the rest of the work here just by grabbing the data um, with the code on line 109 or line 116. Uh, you note also that we can use write CSV to export data and make these CSV extracts available. Um, that's pretty standard, but it, you know it's worth mentioning. Um, so through the rest of this analysis, we are we've created our parking file, and that's the full data set. And we're going to be working with this parking sample, this one percent sample uh, for most of the other code. Uh, anytime you want to check how long does it really take when I when I go against the full data set, just plug in parking in the code instead of parking sample, and you can you can check that yourself. So we're going to get into that in just a moment as soon as this this command completes, which I hope won't be terribly long. Um, I will wait just a moment for that to come through. Um, this again might be a, a product of us being near the memory limit. I think if we weren't near the memory limit, the command would have completed much more quickly. But we, we have that effect to worry about. That's one of the big data issues that we have to worry about. Um, again, if you're working on AMRL, this is a case where um, requesting the correct amount of memory is very important. You know, give yourself some overhead. Um, to, to work with the data. In, in this case, I might even request 64 gigabytes uh, just so that when all these intermediate um, steps run, we st we're still left over with, with a good deal of overhead um, beyond that. So I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up um, so that we can, again, skip ahead once the computation completes. Uh, the 
we're going to look at the parking sample data and then we're try going to try to generate some correlations uh, to see which variables are related to each other. However, we can't run correlations against non-numeric values. Um, so you can then uh, take a step back and just run individual tests of one variable against another, making sure that each of them are numeric with the core test function in line 132. Um, but another approach is in lines 136 and 137 that we um, actually create a, a no character subset of our data that has all of the numeric um, numeric variables kept and the character variables removed. Um, so my parking sample has now completed 423,000 observations. Um, you can see that took two, three minutes to complete. Um, and now when I run something like a summary, I can run it up against the parking sample. And you can see that that's fairly responsive. If I ran the summary against the full data set, it would, you'll get some results, but it still takes a little while. Now I can see what's going on in each of these variables. Um, I have a lot of sort of technical things like the street codes, uh, vehicle body type, vehicle make, precinct where the tickets were issued, time when the ticket was issued, uh, and, and so on. Um, this data set is both detailed but also doesn't have a lot of things we can use for like cause and effect relationships, so that's one of the things we'll see as we go through. Um, so I'm going to attach the parking sample data so that we um, can refer to the variables easily, but keep in mind that when you attach something, you're creating another copy in memory. So that would be a bit of a dangerous thing to do with the full parking data uh, because you're asking for an eight, another eight gigabytes for this attached copy, um, which again, R can manage that by swapping in and out to some extent, but um, it's still a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, difficult. So if I, as I mentioned, if I run the individual correlations, I can do things like the uh, violation code, which is numeric, versus. something like uh, the violation precinct and see if there's a correlation and I'll get this um, correlation of 1.17 or 0.18 rounding up uh, and some other statistics uh, letting us know what is the confidence interval around that estimate um, what is the, the p-value associated with the estimate. Um, and so these, the core test uh, function gives us that, whereas if we just say core, we only get the correlation. So just to show you that, 0.178. Okay, so now I'm gonna run the um, removal of the character data to have a subset. Um, that's only a quarter of the size of the other ones, actually probably a little bit smaller because some of the character data takes up more space. Um, and you'll notice it, it did it really rapidly for the sample um, and actually did quite all right for the, the full parking data as well. Apparently that operation of just dropping the columns is more easy for R to process. So now I can do a correlation matrix of the entire data set with an option that says use the pairwise complete observations, right? This doesn't handle um, not available data well, so we want whenever um, we're dropping the NA data, but we're not looking at just the complete cases that have no NA data for the entire observation. 
but just pairwise. So, right, so when we match summons number versus violation code, only if there's an NA in either of those two do we drop the observation. Okay, so this is a matrix, although it doesn't really display that nicely on screen. We can see there's a one along the diagonal axis, um, but this is a little, we could, we could peruse that, but it's a little messy to, to take a look at. What I'm gonna do next is use the GG core plot package to show you a visualization of the correlations. Um, there's a link here to more about that package. And this um, puts the matrix in, in a grid um, and color codes it so that we can see the strong positive relationships in dark blue, the, the negative relationships in red, um, and we can get a sense of which of these variables might be strongly related to each other. Um, and a little variation on that is if we don't really want to see the numbers themselves but just the significance, um, we can can do it this way. With a, uh, This actually has an X through the things that are not strongly correlated uh, which reveals that there are only really a few variables with strong correlations in this in this data set. All right. So you know this is exploratory data analysis. We're just kind of looking around at our data. Um, one thing to note when we if we look at this data, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between violation precinct and violation location. Um, so that suggests some collinearity. We're definitely not going to want to use both of those variables at the same time. Um, so we might want to drop that column. I'm not going to pursue that right now, but that's something just to note. And if we, something that does have a strong but not identical correlation is issuer precinct and violation location. So the violation precinct is is probably a superset of the exact location of the violation, but the issuer precinct, that's who gave the ticket, that can come from nearby, can come, come from a neighboring precinct, uh, so there's a, there's a connection there, but not as close. We can also do things like our traditional regression on particular variables and see a little bit more of what kind of uh, relationship there is. So this is a significant relationship. It explains some of the variation with an R squared of 0.28 um, and as the issuer precinct goes up by point um, by one, the coefficient implies that the violation location would go up by point 0.3. Um, so we're, we're doing this very quick and dirty sort of look at this data, um, primarily because it's a largest data set. If you want to understand the data, uh, that's you know its own thing that's very important, but we're glossing over it here. I give you a link to the map of the police precincts, right? So we may want to understand something about uh, those precincts are numbered, right? But if we understand where they are in New York City, we would maybe be able to categorize them in different ways. Um, you know, they're probably different ticketing patterns in business districts versus residential districts. Um, and there's a lot of things you you could do with this data once you bring a, your own knowledge and analysis to it. So I, I don't want to, um, that's a very important thing to, to consider, but unfortunately we're not doing it here. So I'm going to run through um, a sample of the code up through 300. So we're just doing two more things really with the code. We are uh, doing some histograms so that we can um, understand how this data is distributed. Um, when I try to do it for summons number, it actually gives me an error saying that the data is um, not quite uh, spread out nicely. Um, the summons number is a very large sort of code um, with numbers up through 85 what is that? Eight billion, if we're reading it in, in the, as a number, 
uh, that may not be a meaningful thing to plot as a histogram. So, so you're going to encounter this in, in large heterogeneous data sets that um, not every variable behaves the same way, is the same kind of thing, um, and you have to bring that knowledge to bear. Here's the violation code. We can see that there are certain violations um, that have a lot more tickets associated with them than others. And again, we'd want to dig into a guide to what those violation codes mean so we can figure out why this high 30s. What's, what are those violations for? Is that overtime parking at a meter or something, something different? Um, and I won't run through all these, but I'll, I'll just show you. Here's the vehicle year. So this is the vehicle year is interesting because uh, if we look at the summary, uh, there's a minimum of zero. So actually, there's a lot of data that had no vehicle year, but instead of entering it as NA, they entered it as zero. If we want to get a good computation of the vehicle year, we'd have to fix that, right? We'd have to go in and correct and replace the zeros with NA. Um, we can see that the maximum year is 2069. So that's obviously a, like a typo. Um, and we want to screen out any vehicle years that are beyond the present. Um, we can probably guess from the median a little bit better what the the average age is, but here the mean implies a mean vehicle age of 1533, but I don't think there are a lot of ancient carts on the uh, streets of New York like that. So again, this kind of basic data exploration can let us see what's going on. We can even do something like this slice sample on line 189 so that we can just pick a few random rows from the data. That's what it does. And we can actually delve in. We, we obviously can't look at 42 million rows of data, but if we sample it a few times um, just to get a feel for what each of those row observations is, um, that's a better way than looking at, say, only the first, first rows. First rows might not have the same pattern as the entire data set. So you can use this slice sample um, and set an N to pull some things out. Uh, the broom package also has this glimpse function that does a quick view of the um, first entries uh, for each variable. So that may be another quick way to take a peek at what's going on. Uh, looking at this, we notice that the um, last three variables are pretty much, there's a huge number of NAs in those uh, entries. So that's that's not good for our other data analysis, and so I'm going to do one more cleanup step with taking the last three variables out of the of the data set. And So we've Instagram comes
but again, kind of bumping limits. So make sure we're still going with our recording. Environment not up at 30 seconds. I know that the prop this is able to range on line two. It's speeding for the of an overwhelming number of entries, a little more under 66. And we have the you know western states that are far away, less likely to get a ticket on the streets of New York. Um, some of the codes are for non-U.S. states, so I'm not familiar with all those, but you have things like ON for Ontario, so you can have Canadian ones. Um, and only when we get to northeast, northeastern states do we have really high frequency. So New York, obviously the bulk. New Jersey, about a, a tenth of the New York level. Then Pennsylvania, then Connecticut. So I'm surprised actually that Connecticut... Um, not as many people know, drive into New York, or maybe they just know the parking rules better, but the number of New Jersey tickets dwarfs the number of Connecticut tickets uh, that are given. Florida, Massachusetts, etc. Um, and, you know, some of these that are more abstract, like the violation code, are just these numbers that correspond to the code. So we can again see that... Um, Item number 38 has a lot. Item number 36 and 37 have a lot. 21 has the most. So we'd have to go and, and look at the parking violation um, reference to, and I, I could Google that. I'm not going to Google that right now um, to see which of these, what the meaning of you know violation code 21 is. Um, and then finally, well, let's look at vehicle year so again we can see how many of those zeros there are so some of these you can see there's a data quality problem that people enter instead of 1986 they just enter 86 but there's re a relative handful of those you know it's not a huge number and this is an issue you're going to face with any big data set is you know how much cleanup and to make it perfect to make all 42 million rows perfect is is going to be very difficult um, how much does it matter to you? It's probably going to matter to you to fix this 7, right? What does that mean? 7 is that... Sorry, I actually scrolled to the wrong spot. Um, oh, excuse me. So I, I'm actually talking about something that hasn't been displayed yet. <laughs> um, so actually, there weren't any single-digit vehicle years. I was um, talking while looking at the violation code. So ignore what I just said. There is still a data quality problem. I can be confident that in a data set this size, there's always some data quality problems. So the general point remains. And we've got 2063. You know, that's, what does that mean? Was that 1963 and it got uh, accidentally entered as a 20? Or did someone mean 2013 and, and the, you know, the maybe the handwriting was scanned and the reader didn't get it right? Uh, but we have just a handful, right? We have one, two, three observations here. Maybe that's not important. Maybe we can just drop all those and not pay attention to them. Um, but if we have mistakes that influence our main point, you know, in large numbers, that's where we have to um, be careful uh, to understand the data. So here, as we saw, there are 100,000 tickets that have a zero. And so... I would probably interpret those as an NA, but um, it's something that you'd want to question yourself about how you're going to handle it in the data set. All right, and so just as a comparison, this final uh, 297 to 300 table is run against the entire 42 million data set. And you can see it did hesitate a moment before it produced a count, but it, it actually does some of these counting operations pretty quickly. So it was able to count and rank and sort the entire data set um, pretty, pretty fast. And we can see the pattern actually is very similar to what we saw in the sample. That's good. Um, we'd hope that the sample is representative of the larger group uh, with the same kind of ranking, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, uh, in terms of number of tickets. Okay, so all of that is all about um, getting to know your data, exploring on a very uh, basic level. Um, you do want to look at each variable, understand what's going on, 
um, because that's going to affect what you insert into your actual models, which is coming up next. So the subsequent part, next part, we're going to get into the machine learning aspect and um, stay